Okay, so I put on this one. Oh, yeah, I can watch this talk for a second. Hold on. That's why we rocked I'm just going to talk for a second. You're official too. There you go. Anybody else? <laughs> Thumbs up when you're ready. You're ready. Okay. This one will, I'll, this one will get there. So. All right, everybody, thanks for coming and thanks for your patience. All right. So uh, let me just introduce myself a little bit. My name is George. Um, I'm one of the founders of an organization called Peculiar. This is um, what we qualify as a Peculiar Allies and Appetizers event. And the sole focus of our conversation is to help people come to a conversation that really focuses on really the most important thing in our lives, and that's love. And this conversation started for me about 13 years ago when my son came out. And I had a, a, a bit of a challenge because things in my life that didn't really qualify my son to be in that space. And so I learned how to love a lot more deeply because of him. And so I've recognized that myself included, that we all need a space that feels safe so we can learn how to love a little bit more. Um, so that's really what this conversation is about. This isn't, this is, you know, there's several things going on here. This conversation is safe. Uh, and thank you to Joshua and Sarah here because this space is safe. Um, that's one of the main focuses of what Joshua does here with his people. And the people that he serves is to make sure that they feel safe. That you can show up the way you are. And there's no judgment. There's no shame. And I think, you know, from our own experience in our culture, it's really the eyes of the Savior that we have an opportunity to learn um, to go to. So Lisa is going to talk to us, and I apologize. I sound like Barry White. <laughs> But um, anyway, Lisa and I have been talking about this, and um, Lisa is somebody very, very important to me for a lot of different reasons. Um, she is very unique and very unusual in this conversation in a very beautiful way. She has, she's a miracle worker. Um, I can tell you that my wife has communicated with her in memorable times. Hmm. And Lisa is there all the time, knowing all well that she is consumed by thousands, thousands of others that are reaching for her because of who she is. She has a very unique frequency. She has an experience where she has allowed her life to be absorbed by the community and somebody like her. So she has an expertise in doing that as well. She has provided therapy to individuals in the community and their families. So one of the things that we focus on in Peculiar is to develop resources that allow us to come to this conversation about how we love each other. And I don't know too many people that have more power in this conversation than these things. So before we get started, I really want uh, a, the spirit to be here. So can we all just take a moment, close your eyes, um, I'm going to close my eyes and I'm going to get quiet in reverence to my son. You go ahead and give reverence to some things point to you. So just take a moment so that we can drop into that really beautiful spirit.
Hey, when you're ready, just come back to us. Mm. All right, Lisa. <clears throat> Thank you, George. <clears throat> it's a lot of sweet things. Did you argue? Is that, that's good enough, isn't it? <laughs> Bill said he wanted to say something about me, but oh, I just heard a lot about me. <laughs> that was kind of sweet. <clears throat> up, up, that's okay. I'm really grateful for George and for Peculiar. And also for Josh and Nate, this space. Uh, grateful for what feels like the sacred calling that Peculiar is for increasing love and connection in the community. My talk, if we want to call it that today, will reflect what I hope is the very best of what the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, should be. Um, I see us here because we believe in the admonition of King Benjamin. We want to be in the service of our fellow beings and we want to be in the service of our God. I grew up in Indiana. I'm gonna tell you first something about what is in my heart. <clears throat> As the only member of the church in the schools that I grew up in, I was a diligent member missionary and shared the gospel with many of my friends. I memorized the Joseph Smith story and uh, shared the Book of Mormon, took my Book of Remembrance to school, uh, and talked about my joy in the gospel at every opportunity. Several of my friends actually uh, took me up on the invitation. And because I talked about it so much, I got a lot of pushback on the story of Joseph Smith. So when I was about 11 or 12, I decided I needed to know if what I was saying had any meaning or whether it was just something. So I don't really know what I expected to occur, but I went in my room and I knelt down and prayed. And something happened. It was as though the ceiling in my room opened up and love came down and filled up the room and completely filled my little soul with love. I wouldn't describe it at all as a vision, but I saw with new eyes how much God loved. And not just me, although I was overwhelmed with that, but everyone in the world. In that moment, I felt connected to everyone as though I could tell how God felt about all of us, how essential we are to each other, to the present, to the future, to eternity. There are no words expansive enough to describe what I felt. That there was a love right there, not judging us, not condemning us, not even disappointed in us, just loving us and believing we will get there from here wherever there is. My understanding of the world changed dramatically in that moment. I had asked for God for knowledge about a specific event and what I had received was information about the divine nature and that it was love. I've come to know that many people have had a similar experience with divine love. It's not unique to me, but it did change my life. I think before that time, I had always had a sense that there were people of God and then there were the others. And as I began to read the Old Testament, it became clear why that seems true for people. God made the separation between God's people and others to be pretty specific. Dire threats are associated with messing this up. The worst thing that could happen to the people of God was to be scattered among the world, among people who were not covenanted to God. These were people to be afraid of if they weren't in the covenant. But what God had put into my heart as a result of that prayer 
was different. <laughs> I now felt and believed there was a plan of happiness for all of the children of God, wherever they currently were on their path, that God would not give up on them. That was the depth of the love of God. I could believe in them too. So I am a mental health therapist, specifically trained as a marriage and family therapist, and received my bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degrees from Brigham Young University, all of them in family and clinically related fields. In addition to deep, deeply enjoying working with couples who are having difficulties in marriage, I have focused on increasing the doctrine of belonging for people who do not feel like they belong in our communities, particularly LGBTQIA individuals, couples, and families. Today, there are 50 therapists who work in the nonprofit clinic, and we provide more than 1,500 therapy sessions each month to these people. More than 500 of these sessions are provided at no cost. After meeting with or supervising more than 40,000 sessions of therapy with families in the LGBTQIA community, I feel like I understand some of the ways in which belonging and not belonging affects us. I've spoken at several hundred university and community trainings to help people understand what we need to know to improve all of our mental, spiritual, and physical health as we make room among us. We as human beings are designed to be sensitive to feeling ostracized when we are treated as different. We can actually measure what happens to us in our bodies when we're ignored when we're passed over, when what is experienced by us it doesn't matter. People who are routinely treated as less than have a great deal more depression, anxiety, PTSD, and physical health problems than people who feel they belong. Award-winning research from the Family Acceptance Project clarifies that young people who identify as LGBTQ and whose families engage in what is seen as unaccepting behaviors have eight times the number of suicide attempts and five times the number of alcohol and substance abuse challenges as families whose behaviors toward their LGBTQ family members were seen by their child as accepting and supportive. In the January 2023, Leah Hona, retired marriage and family therapist, Christy Monson, discusses the parable of the lost sheep. She says something I love. She says that the shepherd in leaving the 99 had to listen very carefully for the lost sheep. She suggests that listening to what we call our lost sheep may be one of the most important ways we have of finding them. And I also want to say that sometimes the lost sheep has found the safest place to be, which may not be in the fold. Many people within our circle of influence are seeking comfort, attention, inclusion, and any help we can offer them. We can be the instruments and act compassionately toward those just as Jesus did. If we are to feed the Lord's sheep and gather into the gospel, we must prepare. Elder D. Todd Christofferson says, we have to be diligent in rooting prejudice and discrimination out of our homes, our church, and out of our hearts. Learning to listen without imposing our own point of view may be the most essential piece of living the gospel with real people. In my first semester of, uh, <laughs> as a grad student therapist at BYU, I was assigned to counsel a couple who'd been married in the temple about a year. They were a quiet couple, tuned into each other in ways that many couples might envy. 
Although neither of them ever used the word transgender, the husband explained he had always believed himself to be female and was averse to his male anatomy from his earliest memories. He persistently yearned to be rid of the physical features that defined him to others as male, but had decided to keep those features because his wife liked them. It felt like the right gift to give her for the present. That couple came to a BYU clinic for therapy because they were worried about the future. Given these feelings, could they stay married? They certainly both wanted to stay married. Would the feelings resolve? Would they go away? If not, could they have children and would they be emotionally healthy? Could they remain close to the church as they both hoped to do? If the husband pursued his current desire to dress in women's clothing, would their bishop question the husband's mental health? Would he even face church discipline? How would their families react? This couple's distress over these questions kept them coming to therapy for several months. It was clear to me there was no mental illness in this couple. They still experienced deep distress about church and family issues surrounding their gender questions. Although this couple is easy for me to remember, there have been so many other gender and sexual minority clients since here in Utah, it's hard now to remember. Gay clients, lesbian couples, gay parents wrestling with whether leaving the church would cause more pain or finally bring relief. What I do remember about working with gender and sexual minorities is if they were LDS, their first and deepest emotional crisis generally revolved around the question, what if I lose my church and my family? Can I survive? This question often came from people who had never broken the law of chastity or any other law, or what we call that anyway. They still felt a strong sense that experiencing gender dysphoria or being attracted to someone of a, what we call the same sex destined them for a life outside of anything they had ever experienced, both in the present and in an eternal sense. I feel safe in saying that for most LDS people in this spectrum, the loss of church and family is a legitimate fear. It's impossible, perhaps, to grow up as an LDS person and not hear the strong message that everything around the gospel revolves around straight families gendered in particular ways. The way the gospel is currently expressed, we do not presently have room for bodies that are gendered differently or for lesbian and gay parented families. Any gray area of accepting queer couples or families in our religious communities is unfortunately suspected of harming society in some way and the future of children. Children who grow up in this milieu cannot help but feel they do not belong. Many of us, as followers of Jesus Christ, become aware of the suffering of people in our midst who do not find a place for themselves as valued members of the community of saints. We watch them grow up and begin to falter spiritually as they recognize how they feel made and created by God is seen and experienced by others they love as less valued. They don't see a place for themselves as fully realized adults in the plan of salvation, and they suffer. Some react by withdrawing from activity with family, friends, and cherished ward members and church activity. Some react by developing, uh, some become more insistent on expressing an identity they want the world to acknowledge, and some react by developing two personalities. One they hope will convince themselves and others that they are okay, living the way they've been taught, and a second personality that also needs attention. 
When they can't find a way to integrate these two personalities, they come off looking and feeling deceptive to themselves and to others. Each of these pathways is a significant challenge to good mental health and positive social development. My friend, Laura Skaggs, who's also a colleague, gives us what she calls the peanut analogy. That is, growing up in the church and not being straight or cisgender is like being asked to go on an airline flight when you're allergic to peanuts, but that's all that's offered on a 16-hour flight. Take the peanuts or you get nothing at all. But if you're allergic to peanuts, what is your choice? To stay hungry for the whole flight. And if you talk to the people in charge and they say, well, we're offering peanuts. Peanuts is what is offered. You have a choice to either be sick or to be hungry, but not actually to be fulfilled. So what is the answer to this suffering? This goes to the larger question of what is happening in our world? If we see what is happening as bright evidence of the last days, decline of civilization, Satan having his way with the world, we will likely respond to our children and their experiences with horror or with blame. If we look at the question more as what is God currently doing in the world with the amazing children being sent to us, we might ask the question differently and see different solutions. Elder D. Todd Christofferson has said, the diversity we find now in the church may be just the beginning. Frankly, he said, I think we will see greater and greater diversity. The fact that people can bring different gifts and perspectives and the wide range of variants and backgrounds will help us learn to be better disciples. Seems to be the design of God to bring greater and greater diversity into the gospel, to embrace more and more of God's children over time. In every age and dispensation, God's people have made judgments about others that have had to be revised in order for God's plan to move forward. For nearly 2,000 years from the time of Moses until the days of Jesus Christ, having an imperfect body was seen as a sign of sinfulness, an indication you are not holy in some significant way. This prevented people from being able to participate in any temple ordinance. This was the religious law for 2,000 years. This prohibition is explained in Leviticus so that an uninfirm or blemished worshiper should not profane my sanctuaries. According to Bible scholars, this did not just apply to priests, but anyone suffering from a physical ailment could not come near the temple. According to the writer of Deuteronomy, a person who failed to observe all the commandments and statutes could be afflicted with consumption, with a fever, with inflammation, with ma madness, blindness, or be smitten in the knees and in the legs with a sore that cannot be healed. Imagine how difficult that was for people who broke a leg or twisted an ankle or had a problem with proper healing, a rash or a skin allergy or any other sickness or limitation. Having it mean to others that your lack of holiness was manifesting and you were unworthy to bring any sacrifice to the temple. Remember that in the time of Christ, people asked Jesus about the sin of the man who had been born blind, wanting to know if it was his own sin or his parents' sin that had caused him to be born blind. Jesus clarified that disability did not equal disobedience or being an enemy to God. He emphasized that far from being an indicator of a lack of holiness, God intended for divine work to come to pass. It may be hard for us to imagine what a paradigm shift this was for people who had considered themselves God's people for more than 2,000 years and the only people on earth that God knew and cared about. Keeping laws was the most important evidence of being God's people. 
even today we have very few beliefs that have been with us for 2,000 years that we've been asked to shift. I want to point out the shift we've been invited to make about these people. One of the ways God intends to make his works manifest is by helping able-bodied people develop Christ-like qualities by serving others rather than finding something wrong with them. This is the work of God made manifest. The current understanding of disabilities, of course, is very different. The church's website says we need to accept them as children of God, help them feel respected, loved, understood, assist in their successful participation and appreciation of their unique gifts and provide meaningful opportunities to serve, teach, and lead. In other words, to make room for them as equals. We've come a long way. The presence of disabled people in the temple is no longer seen as profaning God's house, no longer considered unholy or enemies. Despite our continuing belief that God likely has a perfect body, we do not demand bodies must be perfect in order to attend the temple. We now understand bodies on earth are not all created exactly the same, that God does not usually tell us why, and that something that does not necessarily represent our conception of God should not prevent someone from going to the temple. As a matter of fact, we now give disabled people the best spots in the temple, have the closest parking space, we say, sit up front where you can see and hear better, please feel free, use a cane or a wheelchair, we can accommodate you. There is even a beautiful story in a recently Ahona about a woman with Tourette's syndrome who felt welcomed in the temple despite her random tics and noises she could not control during a temple session. As a people, with regard to this issue, we have undone several thousand years of misunderstanding God's will concerning people with imperfect bodies. Others who desired to join the covenant people have also experienced barriers that have eventually been removed over time. Starting with Abraham, people who were not circumcised were to be cut off from God's people, to be treated as if they had personally broken God's covenant. Abraham was taught this was a requirement that would last forever, not just until Jesus fulfilled the law. This is why the apostles encountered such disagreement from Paul after Christ's resurrection. Paul taught the newly baptized Christians did not need to be circumcised. Peter, James, and John had a difficult time believing that an uncircumcised person could be holy. After all, before Israel was permitted to enter the promised land, every male born in the last 40 years had to be circumcised. It was so important to the Jews in Jerusalem for only circumcised people to participate in temple ordinances that Paul was nearly killed on the spot by a mob when he brought two converts to the area of the temple who had not been circumcised. It was a shift many people were unable to make to imagine that the holiest of signs of what it meant to be a covenant person was no longer necessary. For Peter, it took a vision and a revelation. What God has called clean, call thou not unclean, he was told. After all, Jesus himself had been circumcised, and we have no teaching that he said it was to be done away. But I'm guessing it was still hard to accept that others who seemed outside this important evidence of the covenant could ever be seen as holy or acceptable to the Lord. Imagine how new converts felt when the leaders in Jerusalem sent out a letter advising them they were no longer required to be circumcised as evidence of their hearts being right toward God. I'm sure it was an understatement in Acts when it records that they rejoiced over the letter's encouragement. We've come a long way in our understanding that holiness is not related to whether a body is circumcised or not. 
but in the condition of a person's heart, how they love God and others. Also in our own day, we as a people have made more room in our understanding of holiness for people who have been divorced, people who are not married, people who have no children, people who have trouble having children. We no longer see people of different races as less holy. President Spencer W. Kimball's son emphasized that before the revelation on the priesthood was given, people's hearts had to be ready to receive it. And this process took many years. We are growing and developing as God's people. If God's work with us is a 30 chapter book, says Richard Osler, we may only be in the first few chapters of who he intends to include. We know it is God's work to bring to pass immortality and eternal life of his children, and he is still bringing that about. Perhaps some of us are helping this work by being ready to embrace those who are seen as outsiders. I hope you are thinking of some questions you'll want to ask, because I'm going to open it up for question uh, and answer shortly. The New Testament teaches us a new way to look at God's plan for people. Jesus came to shift the understanding of the people of God to be more inclusive. He started with the house of Israel, inviting them to be more inclusive of each other. The Son of Man has come to save that which was lost, he said, not to divide people. If one is missing, we are not complete. I love that Christ did not berate the sheep for leaving, scold him for leaving the path, express disappointment in his choices, or press on him with doctrine, never to let it happen again. I love the picture of Christ carrying the sheep. It is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one should perish. That's what he cared about. Oh, I wanted to tell you just one more thing then. Um, hmm. It's helpful to remember that pe the people Christ lived among were intensely religious. They tithed, fasted, studied the Torah, attended synagogue, and participated in temple ordinances of the day, all while living under a decidedly authoritarian regime which oppressed them at every opportunity. Were they faithful? Yes, they watched out for each other and supported each other at keeping the commandments because they wanted to be worthy enough to throw off the yoke of political oppression from the Romans. If they could just be righteous enough, God would then fight the battles for them and free them. Their continued oppression by Romans meant that someone was not yet living righteously enough for God to save them and restore the kingdom of God to them. They were unhappy with people who refused to keep the commandments, and they were desperate for a Messiah to unite them in righteousness and overthrow their oppressors. The true Messiah, however, did something different. He encouraged them to shift their understanding from focusing on personal righteousness in the law to an understanding of the nature of God as being one about people, service, and connectedness. The kingdom of God included calling neighbors to rejoice at what's been found, forgive people who have taken advantage of you, reconnect with lost friends and family members, look at those deemed unacceptable as good examples to us. We talk of the parable of the Good Samaritan so much we might think the Samaritans were looked at in Jesus' day as a kind, compassionate ethnic group that lived over on the other side of the hill. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Jews of the day refused to associate with Samaritans. The Samaritans had given up on the true covenants of the temple and set up their own unauthorized places of worship. Guessing you can imagine what kind of blasphemy that seemed to be. Those Samaritans were exercising a counterfeit priesthood, 
and they attempted to claim communication with God by setting up their own temples. If the Jews expected Jesus to criticize the Samaritans for this, they must have been very surprised to hear the parable where their current church leaders left a beaten man on the highway side to die, and it was a Samaritan who bound up his wounds and saved his life. It was also a Samaritan woman who was the first or among the first to hear Christ declare himself the Messiah. Honored with that declaration. What was Jesus trying to teach us? That personal righteousness, keeping the commandments, like the priest and the Levite who passed by were surely trying to do, is not the essence of the gospel. But watching out for the ones who are suffering by the way is what God would like us to do. When Peter wanted us to know the very best way to follow Christ, the response was, feed my sheep. Not pray and study more, but feed my sheep. Jesus wants us to learn that although the Samaritans worshiped in counterfeit ways, as they saw it at the time, at the wrong mountain, the wrong temple, the wrong priesthood, it was the condition of their hearts that mattered. It was not an accident that in Jesus' story, the priest and Levite were not helpful to the man who was left for dead. Jesus wanted his followers to consider the Samaritan was the model worth valuing and following. What good can we do? This is the last part of what I'm going to share, and then I want to ask you what questions are on your mind. Number one, spend time listening, not on how to teach, but how to lift and how to make room. <clears throat> we offer support by being willing to listen and learn from others' perspectives. Don't be afraid to apologize when you've said or done something hurtful. Apologies sometimes are more meaningful than never making mistakes in the first place. Offer protection when others say hurtful things. Speak edifyingly all the time. Don't share private information without permission. Lift others, give them opportunities to share. Welcome discomfort, show up. Don't preach or give advice. And whatever is true about the gospel does not need your defense. Just live the best you know. As Elder Jeffrey Holland taught, when the love of God sets the tone for our lives, for our relationships to each other, and our feelings for all humankind, old distinctions, limiting labels, and artificial divisions pass away and peace increases. I would love to know what experiences you might have had or what thoughts this brought to your mind or what this raises for you in your own experience. If you want to sit for just a moment and see what comes to you about your own life experience up against these ideas about the gospel, I would love to give you a moment to share or to ask. George. So there's going to be a lot of times, or you probably have a lot of times, where, and by the way, this is a beautiful conversation for a lot of different reasons. How do you reframe this conversation to a heart that's been bruised by this conversation? <clears throat> so when you're sitting down and having that conversation, how do you reframe, reframe that so that it can speak to them and soothe and heal them? Well, the very best way is just to listen. Uh, what their experience is in the process of being bruised and to take it seriously. 
to sit with it and offer no explanation, just to hear. Um, one of the biggest problems with the world is that when people say, I've been bruised, someone tells them, this is how you should look at it. This is why you were bruised. If you, ain't nobody need that. What they need is someone hearing about it, taking it seriously, and holding it up against what is it that we really should be as a people. If one person suffers, all of us should suffer. I think that's what we mean by mourning with people who mourn, lifting up the hands that hang down, uh, being there. It's not in putting a Band-Aid on things. Thank you. Good question. What other questions come up for you? What other thoughts or ideas? I'm, o I'm okay with opposing ideas too. I do this all day long. <laughs> and you've heard me talk a lot now. I'm ready to hear you. Yes. Uh, especially as parents, aren't we supposed to set boundaries, set guidelines, and insist that our children stay within those boundaries and guidelines or else we're kind of failing as parents? Well, having uh, been a parent with you, <laughs> I know a little bit about what you're talking about. I also know that as a parent, the last thing I want is a child who feels so constrained by what I'm guiding that they don't learn to trust themselves. What I think God wants from us and what I've experienced after, I don't know how all seven of our children have turned out to be okay, <laughs> um, but I think it's because the whole point was to help them learn to trust the best that was within them. And that didn't come so much from providing guidelines and control and management as it did in inviting them to figure out what was the best that was within them and to figure out how to offer that, to trust that and offer that. I think if God really wanted us to learn obedience as the first law, God could have given us the most outrageous things to be obedient to and just taught us to be obedient, punished us when we weren't, let us figure it out. That would teach us to be obedient. I have to believe what God actually wanted was for us to figure out what is the best that's within us and figure out how to bring that out. And that does not come from close management. That does not come from telling people how to live their lives. That comes from inviting them to consult what is within themselves and compare it to the best they can feel and think about. And it worked for our kids. <laughs> not a very big population, but Susie. So how do you, sorry, how do you help and kids to orient even adults to develop the resiliency for the people that aren't going to give them what they need or are still going to oppose you know what I mean? Like, I do. That are going to mm -hmm. embrace that there's people that just aren't. Yep. So how do you help them develop the resiliency to stand up? There are some therapists I know that that is their entire practice. That is, they are about, I want you to develop resiliency. I'm not even going to ask the outside world to change. The outside world is what it is. I'm not going to alter anything about myself. I'm just going to invite you, child, to be resilient. So if you get bullied in the world, I'm going to ask you to do the work. I'm going to ask you not to dress so gay. I'm going to ask you not to look transgender. I want you to learn to be resilient. And what we actually find out from research, it doesn't work. There has to be a larger picture resilience. People who learn skills of resilience and the outside world is still bombarding them do not do as well. They actually say again, yeah. My follow-up is, how do 
Like, I don't have any queer kids. I felt a super called to be in this space, but sometimes it's hard to help other people. You want to know? Oh, OK. So how do you, like, you're saying, you know, we can't teach the kids resilience, which I agree with you. But the other change is really big. Yes, it is. So you have given us a really good clue right now, because the key to that is we need to be with others who are in a similar situation to us. That is how resilience grows. It isn't just by learning mental health skills, the DBT skills, as we call them, that help us to tolerate distress, that help us to manage our unmanageable emotions, to get through the difficult parts. All those are important. But resilience comes as we actually work together, as we meet with other people, even if we're just playing video games. If it's other people who are like us, that builds resilience which is why it's so important for our children who feel like I'm the only one like this in my family, which is unfortunately how uh, they usually come, to actually be with other people who they see as being like themselves, that's how resilience comes to us. We all feel more resilient when we're actually with people who are like us. Studies show that when we are in a community of people who feel similarly to us and who are working on certain projects or feelings or understandings that just come naturally, resilience grows. And when we don't, it doesn't matter how many skills we have, it doesn't grow. It exhausts. And you probably can relate that to your own life in whatever way. Um, um, it's something that once you recognize, you say, oh yeah, that is where resilience comes. We can be personally resilient. We know Nelson Mandela was in solitary confinement for how many years? Two, two decades almost. Developed some personal resilience, I'm sure. But as soon as he's out of prison, what does he do? Gets together with others and figures out how to take this resilience in a larger way. Because being out of prison and being on his own, it would have been more difficult to maintain that in a meaningful way. So, Good question, Susie. Yes, so, Drew. Um, <clears throat> my son's 21 now, came out when he was three. And um, we stayed in the church and went to church until about five years ago. And we got to the point where we just said, we don't feel like it's um, it's hard for us to adequately explain why we would be willing to do that um, to him, um, and and even more, it, I, it and it's it's interesting because I when I was probably in about 2008, I had a roommate who was black. I was single before I was married, and um, I ended up attending Darius Gray's uh, congregation of the, the Genesis, group. Genesis uh -huh. group a couple of times. And one time I met a guy who was a guest. He did not attend church much. Um, he did not live in Utah at that point, but he was raised by a, um, an uncle. And he was an older guy. He was probably 65 at that point. And his mom, we grew up in Delta, Utah, and moved away um, to go to college in, uh, in Washington State, and um, uh, World War II happened, and um, she wasn't going to church much, and she met a black guy, and they got married, and he was killed in the war, and uh, she was pregnant, and a few years later, uh, probably from exposure to things that she was exposed to while she was building airplanes. She oh. died from cancer, and this poor guy ends up hmm. as a black kid, by the racial. only black kid in Delta, Utah, being raised by his uncle. And you get to the point where you're um, in high school, and you want to go mm -hmm. on dates with other kids mm -hmm. and do things with other kids, and nobody will let you felt like an outsider. And so if you know, you're in a position like that, you look at that, or you look at the kids that um, 
you know, I, and I was mentioning this the other day, and my wife said, wait a second, that's not always true. Uh, it intersex people couldn't attend the temple until about 1990, and my wife corrected me, and she said, sometimes they still can't. So it, it, it's true. It, it's like, at what point do you have to just say, you know what, the, the right thing, the safe thing, is to um, encourage people to, uh, you know, I, I had missionaries come to my house today. Oh, so this is on your mind right now. Yeah, I, I can see why. Today and uh -huh. I said, I'm sorry, you know, I don't think this is a safe place for my family. Huh? And, uh, and, and so, I, I, and yet, I, yeah, I deal with people that are struggling with this all day long. But eventually, <laughs> I see most of them that just can't reconcile that struggle. Mm -hmm. And I, I, don't, I, I don't know what to it is probably, according to recent church surveys, the major reason that many people are moving away from what was previously a nurturing place for them spiritually. Did you say your son came out at three? Yes, Tyler was three years old. I was in a bishopric. And, uh, and I was a Republican state delegate at the time, and he um, he <laughs> we we were putting in a new yard in our in our, at our house, and uh, we had a half acre and a lot of yard to put in. And <laughs> we kind of lost track of him, and we hadn't seen him for about a half an hour. And I went inside with that frantic search for your kid, hoping that they're not finger painting with Crisco or drinking Wesson oil or something, and uh, start hollering and he wouldn't respond. And um, so then I figured he probably was in, into something. And so we, um, we did that hide and seek to try to find him. I found him in our master bedroom closet with a pair of scissors. And he, then she, had cut off all, all their hair and uh, I said, well, it wasn't Tyler then, but I said, Tyler, why did you cut off all your pretty hair? And he said, well, Dad, I want to be a boy. And I said, well, why do you want to be a boy? He says, I want to be a prince, Daddy. And my kids could speak very eloquently, very young. Apparently. So, yeah, we, we had uh, a conversation, and we took them to Walmart salon and had them mostly try to fix the hairdo. And, <laughs> Um, you know, so <laughs> Josh is smiling here. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so, but he spent probably the next three or four years in costumes. Hmm. He wore Expressing that identity. Prince yep, Charlie, yep, that was pretty Prince strong. Prince Philip, Spider-Man, <laughs> Batman, Superman, Robin Hood, um, the Red Power Ranger, and that's how he could, until he got to the point where he could start requesting uh, jazz jerseys and 49ers jerseys and things like that for, to where he could build up out of gifts that he could get enough of a male-centric wardrobe. And you watched, and you listened, and you followed your child's sense of self. Well, we tried. My mother had half of her PhD in child psychology earned at that point, and, a, and she had a, uh, a bachelor's degree in um, early childhood development. So we talked to her, and she's like, well, you know, I had a sister who was a tomboy too, and that, you know, and so Tyler would go up and spend an hour with her once or twice a week buying out a watercolor and how to cook and all that. And he loved the time with grandma, but it, it didn't make a dent in his gender identity at all. And we, we thought that we had a, a, a gay, you know, we had, for the first couple of years, we didn't think transgender, we didn't know him better. So we thought, well, we have a butchie, you know, Lesbian daughter. Somebody who wants to be a tomboy, as your yeah. three-year-old said. Yeah, they want to be a boy. So, and, and then I was like, well, is that going to make any difference to how I treat him or my love for him? And I said, no, it's not. But, 
I mean, it, yeah, it, it, it created a situation where it ended up causing a divorce for us. So um, a miracle of forgiveness, uh, it, 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 it came from that. And my, that's, that's another long story, but my wife divorced me over that because she felt like, uh, based on that book, um, it was porn or it was the causes of what was going on were delineated by President Kimball as it can't be good. Well, it, it was one of the, was the, the three things that would give you an LGBT kid or porn or masturbation or... Something sexual. nefarious. Yeah, can't come from something good. And there's, it wasn't porn or masturbation because there are five. So the only thing that's left is sexual abuse and nobody else had access and if it wasn't her, then it was me. Oh gosh. That was it. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you, Miracle of Forgiveness, for making it very clear where it came from. Yeah. Something that nobody knows. Well, the thing that's really sad is that it's also really hard to find. Hartman Rector Jr. in 1969 in conference said that it was bad parenting that caused LGBT kids to be LGBT. And dang it, I, they buried it. And if they hadn't, Perhaps she would have read that and said, okay, maybe, uh, you know, telling me that I'm a bad parent. <laughs> maybe she wouldn't have wanted to take that on and say, oh, I shouldn't hit that. Right, yes. right. It, it, it makes, I mean, when, when your three choices coming yep. from a prophet of God mm -hmm. are these three things. That it narrows it down. Uh -huh. I it. hear you. Yes, George. Let me ask a question. Uh -huh. Thank you. So Drew, Drew, and Drew does this so well goes to the point and he has this experience. Uh -huh. So I would be willing to bet some serious dinero that you have had experiences where people are trying to unwrap, unpack this conversation. Because For sure. What happens in our cultural experience is that we actually do listen during general conference, state yeah. conference. Mm -hmm. experiences mm -hmm. and I will tell you from my experience my heart and my mind said God speak it through this individual as if God was sending that message directly to me so as you have beautifully described biblically please help us with how do we unpack that conversation because Part of my history was, I love my son, boom. All of this information and data is now bogus. That's a crazy revelation. It's a crazy revelation that I might be asked for the sake of the actual mental health, spiritual health, physical health, of my child or someone I love to do something that feels anathema to what I was raised as. And the question that you asked is, at what point do you decide this? That's not an answer anyone outside of you can give. Once again, that's one of those, I've got to trust my inner compass. I've got to trust my inner self about when that point is that it is no longer safe for me to be part of this. And then your leadership says personal revelation that is contrary to the teachings of the church is not accurate revelation. Right, and, he, and that church leader believes that revelation is for you, right? That's the thing, it's like, okay, do I trust that church leader who has power over me and who can make decisions about me and who can decide that I can't do this or who can align with my wife against me. I mean, there's all kinds of power dynamics here that can really impact a life. Susie. Well, I was just gonna comment to that that at really you truly get to the point where your personal revelation or whatever is what matters. And it doesn't take away from <clears throat> any of the really the building blocks that got you there. It doesn't take away from having really sacred experiences in the past mm -hmm. or now or in the future, whether you're involved with an institution or not. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take away from any of that because no. 
you just figure out that your creators got your back. <laughs> and, and to me, that's all that matters because at the end, it's all going to work out. Mm -hmm. And so if you have to detour, you detour. That's right. Because because our creator knows we need to detour for the health of ourselves, yep. for our families. Mm -hmm. And with someone else not having the same experience, sometimes I'm like, dang, can we not see it? But they don't have the same experience, so they can't see it. And they may not see it. And it's okay mm -hmm. if they don't think we're okay. Because our Oh, creator, say that again. I like that so much, say it loud. It's okay if they don't think we're okay. Yes. That's the amazing thing. And that is one of the ways we actually are like Jesus who was okay when people didn't think he was okay. Absolutely. Thank you, Susie, for that. I promise that we would go until maybe 8.30. Okay. So I want to be respectful of you and everybody here. So does anybody else have any questions, thoughts, everything? Can I just share something? Oh, please. please. So as a space that we have, we focus around giving services to people for them to look who they are. We don't do gender haircutting, so everything's time based. So you don't book a men's or a women's haircut. We don't, it's not a thing because I've had long hair and I don't book a woman's haircut to get a haircut. So a lot of our clients have come in and we've had several beautiful, beautiful stories. Um, we've had a lot of trans children who have come in and it's the first time, I'm probably cry, it's the first time that they've finally felt seen or accepted. And they leave here just sobbing. Um, and it's so beautiful to see that experience and to be able to give that to them. Um, I mean, I grew up LDS. My husband did two very, very different lifestyles of, of the church. And so we have different views on things around it. Um, but when I came to like his family, I was so scared because they're very strict by the book Mormons. My family was like, no, not at all, like the worst. But um, <coughs> seeing them now, it's like after the, like we got married, they came to our wedding and they were there. His dad talked at it, and just like a beautiful experience to see people who are part of an organization that may have not been very accepted before change. Um, one of our clients, he, his family's. LDS, and they came here because they saw us on our, on our news article that we have. And they were like, we've taken our son to so many places, and they won't cut his hair short because they said that he's still a girl. And they, they've tried four or five different places. They've taken him to barbershops, salons, and they, they just won't do it for them. Wow. And so when they came here, uh, he was the first trans boy that I cut their hair, like him talking to me about it and telling me all these things. And I was like, what's the first thing you're going to do? He's like, call my best friend and tell him everything about this place. And I was just like, this make, makes me feel so much better. And, and his mom was like, we're going to we have another person on our ward that has a child that's also queer that we're going to sell to come here. So hearing you talk and just seeing people change, <laughs> it's just like, I think it's better for the world as a whole. Like, Amen. Yeah. I have to tell you, I have to tell you a story. Um, so Tyler's aunt has a salon up in Logan. Mm -hmm. And when Tyler still was going by his dead name, um, was up there when he was about 10, maybe 11. Um, but he was 11 when he social transition. But the thing that kicked it off is his mom dropped him off at his aunt's salon that his aunt wasn't in. And he went in there, he has a, like a, I think 49ers jersey and basketball shorts on and does not pay any attention to his hair. You know, it, it, it doesn't style it or hey, it's wrong, but that's it. And the, the stylist gave him a boy's haircut. He said, don't you think it might just be nicer just to get this cut short? He's like, yes, it would be nicer to get it cut short. He walked out of there with a the boy's haircut, his mom, and out. She was living, but it was an accident. You know, it, was an it was awesome the best accident thing. yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. That's all. Thank you. It's amazing what it means to have that kind of care and to feel like safe in being who you are in a very physical way. Yeah. That makes all the difference. Thank you so much for the space. Yes, Nate. I just had a question around. Uh, 
in, in your experience, do you see that, I didn't come out until I was 29, it was, you know, finally it was the right time for me, but do you see, like, in your practice that coming out at that age, like, it seems like social is shifting down, mm -hmm. but in the church, do you find that that's still <laughs> higher than what you see outside of the church? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, in the church, many people feel like if I just go on my mission and I actually keep all of the rules, then God will actually change me, whatever it is that they feel is wrong with them. So sometimes it is a little bit after that when they come back and they recognize, ah, nothing changed. Now what? So yeah, the answer is yes for all of that. Do you have an estimate on that age nowadays? On that age nowadays? I would say I would say the average is more and more are coming out before their missions and then still trying to make it work because it's acceptable now to come out in high school. It's acceptable to talk to friends about it. Uh, they still get advice from LDS friends. Oh, it's okay as long as you know you don't actually let it into your heart or think of it as a good thing. <clears throat> um, so I would still say the age of coming out is probably before mission, but the age of actually accepting it and saying, how am I going to live as an adult is probably in the early 20s. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we're seeing. Any final questions for Lisa? No such thing as a bad question. No, there are not. And there are so many myths that I love to actually sort of punch that I, I'm always hoping somebody will ask about them, like, why is gender dysphoria not the same thing as body dysmorphia? Why do we actually treat eating disorders by saying this, you are not fat, don't think that you're fat, but we treat gender dysphoria with, oh, we'll go along with what you're saying. I love answering questions. I wish we had more time for it. Okay, can I ask one? Yes, you may, Carrie. <clears throat> so, you want, you want that speaker on me? Uh, a microphone. He's gay. So, so, so for me, I, I don't experience anything to do with um, being queer. Being queer. Yeah. Yes. I, that that word was always a bad word for me. When I was, you said it, it very got, well. It got me in fights. If uh -huh. I called somebody a queer, if I called somebody a fag, whew, I was in a fag fight. is still bad. I was in a fight. Okay. okay. So I don't know. I don't know all the proper. You're doing scenarios. fine. You're doing fine. But my question, what is my question now? You guys got me all nervous. Standing up, we'll do it. Yeah, we'll just, we'll it. breathe. <laughs> It'll come to you, Carrie. It, ha it had to do, it has to do with, um, what, what were we kind of talking about before? We j you said something that sparked something. What, what the age of coming out. The age of coming out. Okay. <clears throat> so, so my question is this. Yes. Okay. Here's what. Here's what my thoughts were. Okay. So, so here I am. I'm a. I'm a person that. I love women. I, I'm attracted to women all the time. I mean, nowhere, anywhere I go. So, but if, but if I give in to those desires that would totally destroy my life right so but why can't i why, why can't i just go around and just have all the relationships in the world that i want to have the way i want to have them with no thought of brains put on me whoa carrie that's not going to make you happy whoa this whoa that and and so how does that how does that fit in your worlds? Well, let me ask you this then. Okay. If you could actually give in to all of those, do you really think it would make you happy? No, I'm telling you it wouldn't. Then, but, but I have to discover that. I mean, I had to I've had mm -hmm. to go, "Whoa, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to go I'm not going to go flirt over here and I'm not going to go flirt over there. That's not my life. I'm not going to do that." It doesn't fit good. within your value system right. and you gradually came to understand about yourself what actually was most so so to. so am i not being true to myself oh i i, I would never guess that <laughs> i mean it seems to me you have built a life around values that are meaningful to you yeah. and what we're hoping is that everyone gets the chance to do that and for many of us there are people 
who the outside, the external voices, never let them actually say to themselves, what would be really meaningful to me? They never get to do that because they're always listening to someone who says, you will only be happy if A, B, and C, and they never actually say, what is inside me? Yeah. What really would make me happy? If you'd never had the chance to do that, you might be having more mental health problems right now. But you figured the- I'm a mental case. Are just, you? Yeah. Okay, well, it seems to me you've done quite well. <laughs> yep. This is a, a really good question. Kurt, did you have, is that like a half answer? Yeah, well, it's kind of a, I guess, part question in my experience. And, and I'm a straight white guy, kind of gay son. <sighs> love him to death. He just got married in June. Love his husband. They are an amazing couple. June what? June 10th. Okay. Is your anniversary June? June 17th. June 17th. And I got to June 8th. June 8th? Any other Junes? Yeah. June. <laughs> June. <laughs> June. Yay. Uh, but one of the things that I think is kind of unique is that I've been married for 30 years. But my experience with my son coming out in the church, and I was baptized when I was 18, jumped in, served a mission, served in the bishopric, did all the callings. Wow. And then it all just became a fog and at one point recently I just lit the match and resolved everything and my whole self was a pile of ash on the floor mm. and, and I feel like I had to do that because the gap and my question is the policies and, and the doctrine became something that was offensive to me, not something that built me up or built my son. Mm -hmm. And that internal conflict, mm -hmm. I, I literally had to go to ashes to relieve the conflict mm -hmm. because there was no other way. I hear you, that was your point. And so my, yeah, so how, have you dealt with people that are trying to reconcile that and what, I guess, how do you help them or what direction do you help them come? I give them no direction, <laughs> but I do a lot of listening because when people hear themselves speak, they start to actually pay attention to themselves and what is important to them. I, the, one of the reasons that I talk about how people have worked throughout dispensations of time is to connect us. Imagine being a mother during the 2000 years when a child with a birth defect was seen for their entire life as unholy or as you were unholy. I admire what I imagine our mothers of that time who said, I'm not gonna allow my child to be bullied by this neighborhood or by this understanding. I do not believe God looks on my child this way. I don't believe God looks on me this way. We will separate ourselves from this. Even though we believe in God, we don't believe in this paradigm or this way of looking at things. For 2000 years, they had to endure this. Mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, people who actually had non-binary people who also existed at the time. Whenever there was a disability, this question had to come up. And there were people who lived then, who believed in God, who had to figure out how do I separate myself from places that are unsafe in order for us to thrive. This has not, this is not new. What is new is that we live in such close proximity that we actually hear from people that we don't want to hear from about ourselves who may have access to stories about us, but it is not new. People who have believed in God have had to endure misunderstanding, um, misrepresentation, do I belong, do I not belong, for centuries. Susie. Well, I was looking back like in the, 80s when the whole AIDS and everything came up and we all said, oh my gosh, the, the, the view of it was that everyone that was LGBTQ was heading to San Francisco and there was all of these abhorrent activities, but in actuality we pushed them. 
We pushed them to a place where they had to go find somewhere else that they could belong. To be resilient. To be resilient. And in being that resilient, you, you have all of these, this neglect and, and not being wanted. And look at those mm -hmm. things that happen in your life. No wonder there's increased drug use. No wonder there's increase of everything. And I always tell people, I'm like, you blame that, but you don't see the source. You don't see that we pushed them there. Did we say, you know what, come be with us. We'll take you up in our value system. You can be with us. We'll, we'll make up. room. Uh -huh. Yeah, we'll mm -hmm. make room for you. Mm -hmm. We didn't make room. We pushed nope. them, and then we blamed them. Yep. And we said, you guys are doing all of these bad things and acting like it's their fault when we didn't allow them in our homes and our mm -hmm. churches and our communities we in the first still place. Do. We still do. It still happens. As a queer person, still, still happens. Still happens. Daily basis. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So just as a, a closing thought, um, there's a lot of really powerful things that are experiences, lived things. How do, I don't know that you can really make a final comment because it's like, I mean, the beauty of life is it never stops. <laughs> and the beauty of experience is that you will only progress with pain. Mm. Sorry. Or love. Newsflash. Or love. Right, but that's the point, though. They uh. operate congruently. They can, yes. Yeah, if you allow them. So, Ignoring the pain doesn't help us grow. Yeah, That's, so just we don't have to final, cause pain to grow. Just yeah. share maybe a final nugget. About growth? Just about. I, I will offer this. I do not believe God sends anyone to this earth to live a half meaningful life or to be limited by people around so that they can't actually live a full life. <clears throat> I believe a loving God parent wants us to make all the choices that are the most meaningful to us, to create something, to learn something from it, and to learn how to love to use every experience we have to say, how can I love more? How can I love myself more? Not just erase myself for others. And that living in community means we make room for everyone to figure out how to do that. That's my final word. You win. <laughs> we all win if that happens, <laughs> by definition. Well, thank you. Thanks, George. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to sit in this nice seat. Yes, do it. <laughs>